Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where we interview entertainment pros about their careers and how they became successful in the industry. The secrets to their success here every week. Here's your host, Sean Ventura. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Ventura. And today we're going to be talking to John Viner, who is a actor, voice actor, and writer for shows like Family Guy, American Dad, Duncanville, Amy Poehler's new show. He's got so many great stories about what it's like to be a writer for these animated shows and a voice actor. If you want to do this for a career, definitely tune in. Here we go. So let's just start and say, how did you get started? Were you like five years old doing skits in your house? Were you in high school? Were you in college? How did you get started with writing, um, voice acting, acting? I, I think I got pretty obsessed early on with uh, comedy in general. And, you know, I was one of those kids who had uh, a ton of mad magazines. And I would save up money because there was a, a bookstore slash comic book store that would sell old issues for, you know, 50 cents or a dollar. So when I could get enough allowance, I would go and buy old issues of mad and then laugh at jokes that I didn't get, you know, with references to stuff from the 60s I didn't understand. Yeah, yeah. I love but, mad magazine. <laughs> But, you know, and then also like the, the, when they had those books, I just, I, I really got into that. And then, you know, I, as a 10 to 12 year old, I fell in love with those like Blanche Knott, uh, truly tasteless jokes books. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I, 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 uh, I, I wound up just really having, I, I enjoyed comedy. I think my, my parents are, are, uh, they're not specifically, uh, focused on comedy in any way, but my, my I think they both like comedy and my father's very dry and my mother's more broad. And so I feel like I have both sides of the comedy in me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I just, I wound up trying to be funny in school. And then when I went to camp, I would be in the plays. And and then when I got to high school, I, I gravitated towards theater stuff again. And then I, I met, met up with, uh, you know, because we both went to the same high school, this guy, Alex Sulkin, who wrote, uh, some of the Ted movies, uh, or I mean, like he was one of the writers in the Ted movies, okay. and now now he runs uh, Family Guy. And then he and I were in a sketch group in our twenties. So uh, yeah, I just uh, in high school we would just do little skits all the time, and 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 I think weirdly in college, and you can't tell because of my voice, but in right. college I just I kind of got sick of uh, theater because my my take on it was always uh, everybody makes fun of kids who are in theater until they get in a movie and then they're great yeah. so you're either the worst thing you're a loser oh my god and then it's if you're successful it's everybody loves you so <laughs> i was still in the the losery uh, part but but actually i i didn't enjoy the sitting around um i think i gravitated towards toward more towards music because when, when you're doing a play in high school or even in college you, they need you there eight hours in the same way that like i hate acting because you need to be on set for 12 hours but you're only shooting for five minutes but right. they need you there and i just i couldn't take that anymore so i i wound up sort of gravitating towards music and then trying to become a saxophone player in college which did not work out also <laughs> um but yeah i just i liked i liked being on stage i liked expressing myself i liked uh the communal aspect of both acting and music, um, which is odd because then I finally went into stand-up, which when do done well feels like a conversation between two people or between you and the audience, even though they're not speaking. Uh, but I really missed, I, I missed uh, just having partners and people to play with. So right after I did stand-up for about two years, I started doing a sketch. Around the time that I met Bob Jurgens, I, uh, I wound up switching gears a little bit and then starting a sketch group with Alec who I mentioned before and then these two other guys uh, Josh Weinstein and Daniel Milder and uh, we did a, a show called The Morts from 1998 to 2000 in what, whatever place in the city they would let us put it up we actually started you know renting out spaces and were you um, I know Bob had that group with Christian Finnegan and the other guy were you in New York doing this or in LA yes so I, I was uh I graduated college with low honors, and I uh, I moved back to New York because I grew up in the city, and uh, wound up there for you know eight years, and trying to do real jobs. But then meeting people like Bob Jurgens, and they were doing their group, and then we would see other people doing like you know A.D. Miles and and uh, Bob Tisdale were doing a two man thing. I, I was working at at Stand Up New York. They let me they let me work the door 
in and then I would get that in exchange for getting spots. Oh, nice. Uh, and then occasionally at Stand Up New York, we would go and do little sketch things. But the the the, the uh, at the time, I don't know what it is now, but at the time, the stage was about four feet by seven feet. So you mm. couldn't really be more than two people without it becoming a problem. Right, right. Uh, but yeah, so I was, in, I was in New York and I kept saying, I'm going to move to L.A., but not until I get my, you know, quote unquote, big break. And as anyone can tell you, if you wait for your big break, it never comes. So exactly. I just, at some point I said, I have to move out to LA. And my joke, which is not a joke, is that I said, I, you know, I don't want to be one of these people that moves out to LA and then winds up working at a shoe store. And then I wound up within six months working at a shoe <laughs> store. That's funny. Which still bothers me. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with shoe stores. I, I like shoes, but, uh, you know, when, when you're, you're on a trajectory that you feel is improving and then you wind up just doing a, a regular job. It, it's, it's hard. Right. Right. So can you talk a little bit about stand up? Cause we have a lot of people who are <laughs> doing stand up and comedians listening. Um, I, I did it in college. I did it like a few months ago after 20 years. It's, it's kind of brutal. Um, you know, you're trying out new stuff and you're bombing and, and, can you talk about how it was for you? Were you, were you just always killing it or was it difficult or was it fun or was it miserable? What was stand up like for you? You know, I, I think I did stand up the right and wrong way uh, in certain in certain capacities. I think what I love about stand up uh, is that even though it's a very dysfunctional community, you wind mm -hmm. up in a community. And so I would almost say that there's. I mean, obviously, it's not a hard and fast thing, but the, you, you almost get into a, a graduating class. So when you start doing open mics, you start with a certain number of people. And if there are 20 people, they wind up, you know, there's, there's, you know, attrition. But at some point, you know, four or five people, if they keep working hard, will wind up either doing well at that. Or in my case, most of my friends who did stand up are now full time working writers. But right. I think so. Yeah. So so finding a community of comedy and having people that you sort of share a comedic sense with it to me was important it more as a, as a human being, I think mm -hmm. than, than it was as being a, a successful standup again, which I wasn't, I think one of the things that I, I noticed in myself that was a, a mess is that I enjoyed being social and I loved the idea of being the funniest guy in the room and then having a drink and hanging out afterwards and, you know, coming up with what are, you know, what are our lives going to look like? And what if we make a movie and, you know, all that, all that crap. But right. the, <laughs> but the people who were really successful were people like Jim Gaffigan, who didn't even say hi. Uh, he would walk in, he had his tape recorder, he would stare at his notes until he went on stage. Then he would tape his set, uh, then get off and then immediately go through and check word for word what worked and what didn't. And, those are the people who I think succeed, you know, in stand up much more than the people like me who I would, I would tape every set that I did. And then I couldn't bring myself to watch it because I hated, you know, watching myself. <laughs> <clears throat> and also the point was, you know, it's the same thing with, I mean, I, I would say stand up is a better version because it's more crafted, but sometimes you'll go to an improv show and say, that was the funniest thing I ever saw. And if you were to watch the tape, you'd be like, Oh, this was slow and not very good, very good. But the yes. live acts aspect of it makes it exciting. So for me, I got the adrenaline rush of sort of being in control of the crowd. And one of the things that I love doing, but I'm, I, you know, I was in no way a Robin Williams is that every time I got on stage, I was also a passenger. So I would say, well, let's, I don't know where this is going myself, but I have, a hundred jokes and I might do them in a different order this set and I might not do any of them or I might do some of them. But for me, the excitement was in, in the, you know, live without a net aspect for me, yeah. even if it was in front of two people. But again, that was me servicing my own, you know, sensory needs instead of, you know, servicing the crowd and, or, or my career. So can you find, John, can you find any kind of connection between that? A lot of standups go on to be writers and writers for comedy shows and uh, obviously some voice actors. What, what is the connection there? It's just people who are funny or people that write funny. What is, do you see any connection between a comedian and a, and a comedy writer? Uh, I think, I, I think the, you know, a, a, a comic is a, a writer who's just doing their own material. 
Uh, right. You know, I mean, I, I forget what the comedian comic divide is, but I feel like a comedian is someone who's, you know, actively funny on stage and maybe a comic is someone who says funny things, but I could be getting that wrong. Uh, I just, I just think that the funniest thing for me was that how many people would come up, especially, you know, older people and say, who writes your material? It's like, I, well, <laughs> let's see, I, I make $12 an hour at my other job. So I don't know how I could pay anyone to. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, and they no, give you're, you 20 you, bucks to go on stage there or whatever they give you. Yeah. You know, I mean, bucks. sometimes if you find a joke that you can't use because it's not for whatever persona you're working on, then you would give it to somebody. But otherwise, you know, you're you're on your own or, you know, for a lot of people, you're stealing old premises or changing jokes. Uh, but uh, but I, I think the reason it, it works out that way is because, you know, comics are generally writers, which is why a lot of times. I mean, you could even argue, I mean, I would, I would on some level argue that, you know, Seinfeld was a great show, but he wasn't great in it because his, his set of skills is being funny. And so a lot of standups don't have the acting part down. They just right. have the, the writing part. And a lot of people, uh, I think, you know, have comedy in their lives because they felt awkward or whatever it is in their youth. So they're not going to be the people who are who are out front at the party they're the ones who are you know slyly in the back of the room commenting on everything right so so yeah i, I think i think it's great when i mean I, I would have loved if my career had taken the trajectory of of being on camera just because because of the stupidity of of the world is you know if people know what you look like you make a lot more money not yes. if you're better so yes you know, I'd rather be the ninth lead on a show nobody's watching than the lead writer on a show everybody's watching because, I mean, up until three weeks ago, you could get a seat at a restaurant. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so where do you go from there? You're uh, doing the comedy thing. How do you go to the next place and, and what are you doing? You mean in my early years or right now? What do well, I do? Well, yeah, no, in your Don't make me think about it now. <laughs> yeah, no, and so you haven't... Um, talked about the acting or the voice acting. Uh, we just really have talked about being a comedian in the early years in um, New York and then LA working at the shoe store. What happens after <laughs> the shoe store? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, it was, it was speckled with a lot of crying in bed and eating ice cream, but, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I was, you know, I, I, in, in New York, I felt a lot more, you know, and this is, this is me going back uh, almost 20 years to making this complaint. So I don't think it's necessarily true, but I felt like the New York comics were much smarter and sharper. And, you know, you had to work within, as I said, a, a stage that generally was, you know, five feet by six feet or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And then you get out here and then there's, you know, the, the, so many actors are, you know, I, I remember in 2000 or, you know, in that, the, that area, so many people would say, "Yay, I'm uh, I've been acting for about seven years, and my manager thinks I should try stand up." And yes. like stand up to me is is not something you try unless it's burning inside you. In the same way that when your parents say, "Unless you need to act, you know, go to go to graduate school and get a real degree." So there's something wrong with you if you have to do any of these things. If you need to act, like like you're picking a very hard uh, route. Yeah, brutal. Yeah. So I, you know, with, with acting, I, I think what was fun in New York is that I, you know, you get out of college and so you've got all your, it's just, just being in your twenties, everybody's available to do things. They're available to come to your shows. They're available to, to switch careers because everybody's making the same $15 an hour or $10 right. an hour. So if you get fired at one job, you just pick up another one because this isn't, you know, this is not your life. You're just making money until your life starts where yeah. you think. Uh, so in that, I just, I felt like. I was throwing myself at a bunch of stuff in New York while doing stand up because I realized stand up wasn't quite cutting it. So I, you know, I tried my hand at writing. I took actual like I, I went to a Columbia University continuing ed class. OK. Writing short stories. Some of the stuff I was doing wasn't funny at all intentionally. Uh, and then I I wound up, you know, in a sketch group with people because I liked that. And then I in one of my day jobs, I was working doing industrial films. And so I met a director and a producer through that. And so we made a, 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 a feature that went to slam dance because mm -hmm. we, we, we did a whole feature that was like a mockumentary about a guy with, you know, basically a PA it was making fun of, even though he's very successful, but like the sort of Scott Burns, not Scott Burns. He's, he's good. Um, what's his name? Uh, Ed Burns, mm -hmm. uh, 
you know, like like he he made all these movies because he was kind of handsome and did you know like stuff and or like Craig Schaefer, these not Craig Schaefer. What, I'm saying all the wrong names. Anyway, no, uh, but I know Eric, Ed Eric Burns. Schaefer, Everybody Eric knows Schaefer. Ed Burns. Yeah, I know what you mean. Right, but I was just sort of <laughs> the premise was. I, I played it from the point of view of like an idiot who was a PA and then he decided he's going to be a director because he bought a baseball hat. And, and <laughs> yeah. that's what it seems like Ed Burns did, but it succeeded and he got a beautiful wife and they keep, they keep giving him money. But, right. but the truth is like, you know, I, I was also angry and bitter that I'm sitting there going, okay, well I'm the same thing as this. Why am I not getting this? I fell into that, but then we made a film uh, that, that, I was really excited about because it was a mockumentary and it was kind of a pre, I mean, it was pre, uh, curb your enthusiasm. And I was like, nobody's in this space of doing sort of reality. That's not reality where, you know, you kind of play yourself, but you don't. Yeah. Um, I'm not saying I, I, I was new, it was invented. I'm just saying no one at that time was really focusing on that. Right. And so I, you know, we got in the slam dance and I got really excited, but Every time I'd show it to an agent, they'd say, now, I can't tell if you're acting or not, so I don't know if this is good. And then I would say, did you laugh? Yeah, no, I laughed, but I just can't tell if, I was like, but the point is not for you to decide if I was good or not. If you laughed, then you enjoyed the movie, then I was good. So it just, you know, it was the same thing when, when I did the sketch group. And, and again, I think, I think everybody in this business, what you, what you forget is, uh, and I make this joke about anybody who's successful versus me, is when you are successful, if you are J.J. Abrams, you go into any meeting you go into in any room at a studio, they, they go, hey, J.J., thanks for coming. What are we buying today? <clears throat> and, and he goes, I don't know. And they go, we love it. Here's, <laughs> here's all the money in the world. And then I go in with a Bible of ideas and they say, we can't buy it. We're so sorry. Now, what is it? So, yeah. you know, that's and that's the reality of the business is when things are going well, everything goes well. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's almost impossible, no matter how good you are, because everyone is starting from no. So when we did a sketch group, you know, the the first thing uh, people would come and see our shows like managers or, or agents and they'd say, yeah, I, you know, I just don't represent sketch people you know it's just this isn't a great time for sketch having said that it was a time that ucb and the state were doing very well right but <laughs> but they said you know we i don't re represent sketch and i said oh well you're in luck because we aren't sketch performers we're actors and writers who are using this as a venue to get our ideas out and so we had one one sketch that i thought was very funny that uh, i think alex sulkin wrote the first draft of and uh and then i was like okay screw this i can't deal with with all this so i i got the other guys in the group and then we we actually got eddie pepitone who's a very funny uh stand-up and uh, actor uh to be in it to replace alex part and it was about a support group uh like an aa group but it was a support group for men who've been beaten by their girlfriends at sports and <laughs> and so we i rewrote it uh for eddie and and then we worked it worked it out as a group and then we sort of group directed it and it got into sundance as a short and suddenly all these people came out of the woodwork and were like, well, we didn't know you guys were filmmakers. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from working in the sketch groups? I'm guessing Family Guy or one of the Family Guy shows, one of the Seth shows, um, because of the guy who's in the comedy group, or am I wrong? The guy who's in the sketch uh, yes, group? Yes, yes. Uh, so I moved out to L.A. I, was a, I actually did warm up on The Late Late Show on CBS for a short amount of time. Who was the uh, host? Because they've had different hosts. Yes, I, that was when Craig Kilborn was the host. Okay. So I had been, uh, because my friend Alec had worked on the show and my other friend Wellesley, uh, they both worked as writers on that show. And I was working at New York, you know, in New York at a, at a again, the production place doing industrials for right. corporate uh, entities. And so I would wake up every morning and, and write topical jokes for monologues. And then they let me send them in so occasionally, you know, I don't know how many I got in over the course of whatever time, but I, I got, uh, you know, I did a bunch of, of, I got a bunch of jokes on. And so I was like trying to get into that joke writing thing, which was never my strongest suit, but I, right. I, I was just, I just want to get a job. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and at the same time I was acting and I got this part in the Gilda Radner story, which was a biopic that they did in 2000. One, two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because I'd done that and I'd been doing stand up for a while, I submitted a tape and they and uh, Matt Harowitz was running uh, or was part of the the people who decided if you can 
be on <laughs> that I could actually be be doing stand up on TV. Uh, he he gave me my four minutes of of uh, late night fame. So I was really excited. I I practiced the same set over and over again, which was torture for me. Yeah. My whole set was about uh, it wasn't easy uh, about being growing up rich. So it was it was it wasn't easy having it easy. Yeah. Uh, and that was my you know my character that I I was working on at the time. And uh, so yeah, but then I when I was out here in L.A., uh, they said, "Well, we actually need a warm up. Would you be interested in doing that?" And I was like, "Yes, I've just been waiting." Like, I, you know, I was kind of drilled into my head mostly by my parents and and other adults in in business saying, you know, don't go out to L.A. without a job. So this became, "Hey, I got a job. I'm going to make a few hundred dollars a day." You know, just basically keeping people laughing and giving out you know candy <laughs> in between <laughs> commercials, getting dance contests going. Uh, so yeah, I came out and I did that, and uh, at the same time I was writing, we'd already done this. This uh, had gotten the the short film that we'd made from our sketch into Sundance. So there had it felt like I was having momentum, and then all the other members of the group moved out here at the same time. So we kind of said, all right, we're gonna we're gonna do our thirties out in L.A. and become you know big stars. Which obviously you know you have to explain who I am, so it didn't work out. But. <laughs> uh, but we, you know, we 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 landed and and uh, I I got that job. Alec was writing on the show at the time. Then he left the show with Wellesley to go write on a sitcom. So they were already off on that path, which is the path I I actually really wanted. But at the same time, I was doing stand up and hoping that I, my acting would go. And I had just done a, a, a series of McDonald's commercials. So okay. that was th that looked like oh, if I'm going to be the face of McDonald's, I could, that that will give me some. You know, I'll get some eyeballs from that, and people will know what I look like, and then maybe I can get on a sitcom. So it was all it was all going that way. But then at the same time, none of it was coming in. So I, I spent all my money. I started working at the shoe store. I lost the job, and I was like, all right, I'm moving back. And I kept flying back to New York to take work gigs to pay to be out in L.A. Oh, and, okay. and it just got to the point where I was like, I'm too old for this. Uh, and at, at that same time, I was... I finally, after eight years of doing stand up, I got to be put on new faces uh, in Montreal. And so, like in 2004, all these things came together where I, uh, I wrote a script uh, over Christmas vacation in 2003 when my parents were like, my parents were always like, why are you going out so much? And then I sat home for Christmas vacation and they're like, why are you staying in so much? Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> I was like, I need to write a script to save my life. Yeah. Um, so I just sat at home for you know weeks on end at my parents' place and uh, and wrote a a Family Guy style uh, uh, spec uh, okay. pilot and and uh, I wound up submitting that to Seth and he really liked it and then he said yeah Family Guy's coming back and American Dad so I might be able to put you on one of those shows which you know was I was I was just blown away and I was so excited but at the same time there were no promises and I kept waiting and I was like all right if I get this then that's great and if I don't then I'll just move back to New York and and you know become a mid mid management person right at a bank it'll be fine I'll be fine okay so uh, we have to we have to I have to stop you for a second you have to go back because people want to know how did you get the script to oh, Seth Tuesday. because of I'm sorry I keep right. forgetting his name Anthony Alec. Alec yes because of Alec yeah, so okay. so uh, you know everyone's got a different path. Uh, you know, a lot of people have the path of my dad works at, but right. Uh, but I didn't have anyone in my family who was in the industry. Uh, neither did Alec. Uh, but but because I had started to work with people, and and Alec and Wellesley had worked with Seth MacFarlane after Family Guy had gotten canceled the first time. So Seth was working on on under a deal. Uh, I guess at 20th or Fox mm -hmm. and they put him on a live action show where he met Alec and Wellesley and they became friends. And so I, at the time was focused on writing. I mean, sorry, it was focused on acting and stand up, but we all started to hang out a little bit. And so I got to know Seth when okay. family guy was done and okay. was not in the, in the picture. And at the time Seth was just saying, Hey, I'm, I'm trying to put together another animated show called American dad. Uh, you know, which was relevant to, I mean, it's still relevant, but it was relevant to the time because it was, I mean, as, as he was building it, it was, it was, you know, post 9-11. So it was, it was, you know, about a dad who's in the CIA and, and it was about Republicans versus de Democrats, but that's all right. in the past. Uh, so anyway, it was, it was a, a good time to meet somebody who was in a good position, but at the same time, I never thought I would necessarily be working with him. But then when I started writing scripts on my own to try to get work, when this came up, 
I already liked Family Guy a lot and totally got all the references because we were all the same age. So then I I put together uh, two specs, one that was an original and one that was an Everybody Loves Raymond just to show that I could do story structure and write for character. Right. Uh, and, and that's another thing that's very frustrating, again, about the business. I'm saying this as a bitter old man, but it's it makes it easier if you know about it going in is that even agent agents are all starting from no. They can't say the word no because if you're successful, then you may not work with them. So they'll just say, ah, oh, you're not there yet. Or do you have blank? So if you write uh, a spec script for a show that's on the air, like if you wrote a Stranger Things or something, right. they'd be like, this is great, but right now what people want are originals. So then you write an original and they go, this is great, but what people <laughs> really want right now are haikus. And then, I mean, I, I, the amount of things, and I'm not even exaggerating that you would hear of like they what people want right now are one act plays. What they're looking for is short stories. Right. What they're looking they keep for changing is a packet. It. They keep yeah, changing no, so it. whatever you have is not what they want. Oh, you were so close. Yeah. I've so actually close. Pi I've pitched a show I pitched a show once and I mean I I I'm still glad that I didn't, you know, wind up tearing the walls down. But I pitched a show and at the end of the pitch, the people I pitched to looked at each other and they said Oh my God, that was so close to what we're looking for. Um, we just, and I was like, okay, well, what, what's, no, no, it's like, well, you were setting it in sort of like a, a, a suburb high, high school. We want to set it, you know, like in the projects. And I was like, okay, but all the premises there. Yeah. Oh, you nailed yeah. it. But you, what we're looking, I was like, well, I'm going to, I can leave the room for five minutes and come and back and say, yeah. and change that. It's like, oh no, ah, oh, sorry. No, we already heard it. So now it doesn't count, but you were so close at the secret. You almost, it's like, you know, and then you go back to the same thing where, you know, they're buying untitled, you know, something project from someone who hasn't figured it out yet. Right. And so, so I, it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know, know I'm going those, off on a tangent. I know those <laughs> stories because I have several friends who, you know, did different things, but one friend uh, lived in LA, he was a writer and he worked at CA and he would leave his scripts on the agent's desks and never hear anything. It's just so cool that you actually had a connection to Seth. And that, and that's a question that you, it would be really cool for you to answer is like, what is Seth like? I'm sure there's so many writers who love all those shows. Um, Obviously, he's some kind of workaholic because he does so much content from the TED movies to all the animated shows. But uh, can you briefly just talk about what he's like as a guy? Yeah, no, he's he's a very sweet, uh, I would say, as, uh, if for anyone who's that successful, relatively normal. No. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's, he's, he's a, a really good guy. He's, uh, you know, got a, a great ear. I mean, that's... When we, like it, it, he's one of those people when you first meet him he, he's not he's not going to be i mean this goes back to the stand up thing mm -hmm. but he's not going to be the person at at your dinner party who's banging the table and doing impressions and making everybody laugh right. he's the person who's who's going to be watching everybody and taking it in and then going and then catching like you know d like just doing a, a an impression of someone later casually and you're like wow i never even noticed that about that person you yeah. know, and I and I think that the you know he he's able to to hear things and see things that a lot of people can't, and also to reproduce them, you know, in 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 ways that it still astounds me that that you know when we have our table reads, he'll he'll have multiple pages where he's having conversations with himself, you know, <laughs> amongst right because he, has three so, or he four does characters. so many character voices, right. Yeah, and and each one when you hear it, you go, oh, that that's a fully f you know fleshed out realized character mm -hmm. you know that's like when i when i i mean i i'm fortunate so far that i've been able to do some voiceover but i i always consider myself the the sort of dana carvey approach to i mean i think dana carvey is amazing but i'm saying right. i'm uh, like whenever dana carvey does something it's dana carvey doing that person and you love dana carvey so you like watching it when daryl hammond does an impression you don't get a sense of Daryl Hammond, but you get a sense of, oh, that that is what Jesse Jackson sounds like, or that's what Bill Clinton right. sounds like, and right. how he acts. But I, I feel like my enjoyment is you always know it's me, but here I am doing a German guy, here I am doing a French guy. They're all they're all they're all just me making fun of people. So you're basically listening to to you know like I, I'm not hiding it. Whereas Seth can, you know, a lot of times I I can't I won't know that that was him. Right. You know, and that's and that's a great skill. It'll just feel like it's an authentic, you know, new character. So, yeah, yeah I mean, he's 
Yeah, and, and he also is very generous in the fact that I, you know, he, he brought people like me into the fold. And then if I were to pitch a joke and I did, you know, my chairman guy, what's going on over here? Mm. You know, and I do that. Then he goes, and we'd say, well, John, why don't you read it at the table? Because it got a laugh in the room. And then I would read it at the table. And if it got a laugh, then I would get cast in the part. And what was, again, like the business works in weird ways or life works in weird ways is I could not... I, I, in New York, I couldn't get arrested for voiceover and I took, I can't tell you how much money I put into making a reel and doing all this mm -hmm. stuff and doing like ta 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 you know, and do, like doing right. exercises and, and whatever, you know, like nah, 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 working, like you, you do everything to try to break into this space uh, and none of it worked. Uh, but the two times that I ever got on, you know, got to do voice work were when I was writing on another, I was writing on a game show for the oxygen network. And I was like, we need some, we need, you know, cause every, every time we had people on as contestants, they introduced themselves and they were all terrible at introducing themselves because they're all like 17 years old. And I was like, we're ruining the first minute of the show by these people just rambling. So I was like, we need just to have, I mean, cause I was doing it for free. I'm like, I'll just go and contestant number one, she hails from, you know, Fairfield, New Jersey, her favorite color is blue. So whatever it was, like you'd get it out of the way. And so I did that for free. Uh, but I had such a good time doing, you know, tell them what they want, Johnny. Uh, I was having so much fun with that, that later on I got a job from one of those producers to actually do that for like 70 bucks a day on another show. <laughs> so anyway, my, my point is that, you know, that, it did, it did all add up in the same way that like having made, you know, I, I, I still don't know what the number is, but I know it's under $10,000 in, in the eight years I did stand up, you know, combined. Right. But over those eight years, I wrote notebooks and notebooks of jokes. And then when I got to, to family guy, suddenly I was like, if we had a premise area, I was like, Oh, I have one line that worked from a stand up bit seven years ago and it would be in my head. And I was like, Oh, I think we can repurpose that joke here. And so, you know, the work done one place helps out somewhere else in the same way that I think the, the work done doing all those stupid workshops for voiceover and, yes. and doing just a daily thing where I was reading. Um, I mean, I, I, this, is, this is a very quick story, but like I, uh, one day, and I made a, a good chunk of money, it was like the only time I'd ever made money in my 20s, is I did a bunch of McDonald's commercials uh, and we had to do all the regional commercials. So everything was city to city and state to state and each offer was different. So I had to be like, you know, come into Tucson and get the 79 cent, you know, whatever the McFrap is. Uh, and 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 at, as I was doing it, each time I would do it, they're like, John, that was great. You're coming in at 14.6 seconds. Can you just stretch it that 0.4 seconds? Which I was like, yeah, of course I can. And I'm like, what? what? But when you do like 100 in a row, you do start to feel even a half second of space in a 15 minute or 30 minute 30 sorry 30 second or 15 second spot you start to go oh right like the the timing did change and, and if i lean on this word a little more yes. here yeah and and you know and or just like when someone says pace it up but don't make it feel fast you're like oh i got it and, and then you're going what uh <laughs> but after a while you sort of get used to it so i was doing all that in new york and then by the time you get into the booth for family guy or something and they say, hey, we need, you know, try to shave a half second off. It doesn't come across as the craziest thing you've ever heard. Right. Just read it a little faster. But let me ask you this, because I don't even know. And maybe um, people don't know, like when you record for Family Guy or Cleveland show, are you um, just recording your lines all separately? Like Seth just does all his lines. Or are you in several booths and you're reading through the script? Uh, no, that's a good question. And, uh, there are different shows that do it different ways. Family guy, uh, because of, I think at, at a certain point there was overlap of people being in the booth at the same time, but it's, it's always good to have isolation. So you have individual takes. Right. And, and now because, you know, Mila Kunis is on the show and Seth Green and Alex Borstein is out of the country sometimes. And so everybody and, and Mike Henry's in Virginia. So you just, you wind up doing your parts, uh, separately, but because people like sometimes the person who is the director or whoever the, you know, the, the showrunner who's who's directing you right. will read, read the other person in the scene into your okay. headphones. So okay. that you are having a conversation. But I think the logistics of it just have made it impossible for everyone to be in the same room. Right. Having said that, I like one of my highlights of my my business life. Uh, and again, it was for scale. Uh, <laughs> but no, it was it was great. This uh, this uh, 
animating director, animated director uh, Zach Moncrief, who used to work at Family Guy, brought me in for Scooby Doo, uh, one of the new Scooby Doo's, and okay. they read the whole script in order, oh. and all the actors are there, and I I just came in because they were doing multiple sessions, so I came in for whatever episode I was in. And Frank Welker, who's been doing, you know, has done a million voices, but also is the original Fred from Scooby Doo, right. and now does Scooby as well, uh, was sitting there, and I didn't recognize him because I don't, you know, like voiceover people, I don't. But also, I was just sort of nervous and taking my seat, right. and then I put the headphones on, and suddenly he talks, and I was like, it was like the Ratatouille moment of, you know, you eat the Ratatouille, and it brings you back to being four years old, right? I just was like, oh my god, that's it. it was, I mean, I, I got starstruck. Yeah, I got starstruck. Yeah. I mean, I almost we we had a crossover episode of The Simpsons and Family Guy, and Dan Castellaneta came in and and did Homer at the table, uh, and Hank Azaria was on the phone, and and mm -hmm. but but so I was like, when he did Homer, I was like, oh my god, you know, the, the reason I'm doing Family Guy is because I fell in love with The Simpsons, but for some reason, when Grandpa Simpson said something, like I got chills. I mean, it's like I, you don't know how invested you are in all this stuff and how much it means to you until you're sort of like right in the presence of it. Right. So, so that, that is missed a lot of the time in, you know, in doing a show like Family Guy because you're not getting the chemistry in the booth, but it all, right. the, the alchemy of putting the voices together later on works. Okay. Uh, and, to that, and to that point, just to make a final thing is when I started at Family Guy, Seth was there full time in the room. Mike Henry was there full time. Alex Borstein was there as Lois. So you had, you had like when when Seth and 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 Alex would do Peter Griffin and Lois Griffin talking, we would all crack up, and we knew if we're cracking up that it just goes straight in the script. Like right. you don't have to test it because you know it, it's, everybody it's else is fun. cracking yeah. up. Right, right. Yeah, like when Stew, Stewie is going mama ma ma. Like when Seth is doing that as he's thinking of it in the room and you're laughing you're like there is it's great because you know it works and that's and that's what i feel like i miss you know when you don't have actor writers in the room is you're just you're doing your impression of them so my stew is going to sound like this but that's not very good <laughs> <laughs> but i i do it not to like because i think i'm funny at it it's just like i'm trying to get as close to how i think that line will sound coming out of that character to give people the impression of what what it will sound like if it succeeds and makes it on air right sorry that was a long-winded no 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 it's totally cool it's uh i'm sure it's very i mean it's interesting for me so people who want to be voice actors and and work on these shows it's going to be incredibly interesting um so can you talk about that a little bit um just i know you just kind of did but is there any difference on working on different shows like Family Guy or Cleveland or what was the other one you did? American Dad. Well, like, uh, what is yeah, the I, difference I wrote, between the shows? I've done some voice stuff on American Dad. Uh, and I actually used to do the table reads for about a year um, where I would just do, friends, theme. You know, so I'd read those parts again so that the writers could hear their lines uh, through, you know, through that, that sound or at least as close as they can get. Uh, I think the biggest difference when you work on different shows is tone. Um, and, and obviously American dad, Cleveland show and, and family guy are all similar, uh, ish, you ish, know, yeah. uh, but, but they do have different tone and, and uh, you know, the Cleveland show comedy was, was a, a softer, you know, gentler, fa more family oriented show. So when you have a great, uh, hard joke, you may not be able to get it in. Um, and then sometimes if you have a really soft family joke, you may not get it in, you know, character joke at Family Guy because it, it might not fit that spot or we want something that's really going to, like, we want the hard laugh. We don't want the the smile and giggle. Right. And, you know, I think different shows have, have I haven't worked on th that many others. I've worked on this show, Duncanville, mm -hmm. uh, which w was really fun because we, we, we had a lot of elements of Family Guy mixed with The Simpsons uh, because the creators worked on The Simpsons forever, and and so it was a gentler but in some ways crazier. Uh, like I, certain ideas you could put out there that I couldn't possibly do maybe at, at Family Guy. Uh, and then with you know when I, I just uh, I just worked for a few weeks uh, in this pandemic uh, 
via Zoom on a new show that Jack Black is going to be voicing for Netflix oh. about a nudist colony. And my friend uh, and co-writer from from the Cleveland show, Aaron Lee, is 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 spearheading and running that. So uh, so that was interesting because you're starting from scratch on something mm-hmm. that just has a pilot, and okay. and so you know I wrote episode two after they gave me an outline. We broke a story uh, for that character, but I'm going off of you know four pages or five pages of of character descriptions and Bible stuff, and then reading a pilot. And it was really daunting and exciting at the same time to write the, the episode two because I'm I'm just winging it because I'm going well I don't know what this character's history is I don't know how I mean I know this is the dumb guy but I don't know if he's dumb in this way or that way right. or if he he's you know like I I am always a fan of characters that are the you know like going back to Ralph Cramden I, I like the arrogant idiot the person who's confident in their mistakes. Right. Um, I mean, not when they run the country, but hey, everybody, this is not political. Uh, no, but I, I mean, I, I like the idea of that versus just sort of a, just a stupid character. But then sometimes, you know, like people loved Beavis and Butthead. That's a that's a certain kind of stupid. And right. people love Dumb and Dumber. And that's a, another different kind of well, stupid. Well, you have Homer Simpson and Peter Griffin, too, which are yeah. kind of dumb guys, but lovable. Yeah, and, and it's also a question of... You know, I, I think one of the hard things to do is uh, is figure out what the level of, of self-awareness is, because I think self-awareness often takes away from someone being funny if they know they're being stupid. So, you know, I, anyway, my point is, it's right. just it was interesting to to play around in a new, you know, in, in uncharted territory, whereas on Family Guy, we've done over 300 episodes. So, you know, it's we're still trying to find new things, but we've done a lot. <laughs> right, so, right. So, so let me hard. just it, let me just interrupt and ask you: How does it work? So you have several writers on the show. Do you just write one episode and then all the other writers chime in, or do you all seven of you write the episode together? How does that work? The writing. Yeah, it, it depends. It really depends on on uh, the showrunner's preference, uh, and also sometimes uh, life jumps in. Okay. Uh, but but the the general idea on the play at Family Guy is that someone like, like we'll do story days. So usually, usually it, it, they'll happen after a break. So if we get a hiatus and people are off, like, let's say for Christmas or, you know, if we're, if we get a month off in the middle of the season or at the end of the season, when you come back, we'll do story days and, you know, we'll say, please come in with a few areas. Uh, and sometimes they're fully broken where it's like an A story, which is, you know, is, is going to dominate the episode. And sometimes it'll be a B story, which is, well, I think, you know, we, we could just do something where, uh, you know, Stewie winds up, you know, clipping his toenails and, and whatever, and has an experience. And then you just say, all right, well, that's not gonna be a big story. It's just, you know, or whatever he paints his toenails and that becomes a story. Right, right, right. You don't, or you don't Roger need to hang. does something. A yeah. So small Roger does story. something. Right, right. It's just, yeah. it's just a, <clears throat> something that, that you cut away from the main story to, to track and it doesn't have to have big stakes and it doesn't have to big, big have to be, have big moves, but you'll right. come in. And so at some point, you know, generally if somebody has, has come up with something whole cloth themselves, they will get to write that first draft, but you'll, you'll get sent in a room with, you know, an upper level writer, uh, pr- probably one of the executive producers, and then two or three other people. And you'll spend anywhere between, you know, a day or two to sometimes over a week sort of hammering out what each beat of that story is and the B story. And, you know, and then you have it on a big whiteboard that's, you know, six feet across right. by four feet high. It's like and, a puzzle and you got to put it together. Yes. You and, keep and, refining and, and, it. I mean, we're, we're, we're not doing anything that that uh, I mean, I think everyone's sort of got the same approach, which is, you know, the B story might be in one color pen and the, the A story is usually in black in black pen. And uh, and then you're able to sort of track. All right. If I just want to read the B story beats, I can read them because I just read the, the blue. Uh, and then you, you once that happens and we feel confident in that outside room, you bring in the heads, of whoever's running the sh- whatever show you're on. And you'd say, can I walk you through this story? And. At that point, they may say, I like this, but Act 2 starts to get wishy-washy, and why don't, we need a, another, a bigger turn at the end of Act 2. So it can't just be that, in, you know, that Peter's upset. It has to be that Peter's going to leave the family. You, know, okay. like you, you, want, you want a harder act break before the commercial. 
Uh, so then we would fix that. Then that they go, great, let me go pitch it to the network and studio. Then they, they go call the, those people and say, we have this story area. And then if that, if that goes well, then that one person who is going to write the episode goes away for two or three days, writes a 10-page outline uh, of what's going to happen, and then they come back in, get notes, and then go off usually for two weeks to write a 40 to 50-page first draft. And then that draft comes into the room of, you know, 15, 18, right, who, however many writers, 10 right. writers on your show. And the heads of the show will say, everybody read this. Uh, we think it's really good. Uh, and then, well, but we need to replace this, 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 and this. So you four people go in a room and rewrite this scene to make it do this. Uh, okay. Get rid of this cutaway. Um, you know, like there'll be a cutaway, let's say, like this is, Peter will say, this is worse than the, the time I started wearing, you know, short shorts. <laughs> and then we'll say, hey, we have something similar to that in another episode. So why don't you four people go in this room and come up with five different this is worse than for Peters. And so then you'll go in that room and come up you know, for the day or however many hours and, and come back in. And then you pitch, as I did before, like Peter, I don't have a good Peter, but I go, hey, there, what's going on, Stewie? You know, and then I would do my bit. <laughs> you know, I would read we would all read parts like we're having our little, you know, our little uh movable theater right and and if things are funny enough and get laughs they get put in the script and if not another room gets sent out to replace that that gag and by the end you you have this like semi frankenstein thing that was improved from your original draft and then you take it to table uh where you read it in front of everybody then that gets recorded the recording goes to the the u.s animators who do like a black and white sort of pencil style drawing uh, right. It's almost like a slideshow. Mm -hmm. And then we all view that as a writing group and as a staff of the whole show to, to see where the laughs are, to see where it's it's lagging. Uh, and then once we like what shape that's in, it goes off to Korea where it gets animated in, in the way you see on TV. Right. Ooh, that's a lot of work, man. And would you say that your, um, your hours are normal hours? Are you working eight-hour days or are you working like 12-hour days when you're on a show, when you're working on a show? I, it's, I mean, it, it really all depends on, you know, production schedules and, and I think animation generally, the hours are never too bad. I mean, we, we kind of have, we kind of don't work more than eight or nine hour days in okay. general. Uh, but that's also because you don't have a, you don't have a tape night. I mean, there, there have been plenty of right. two or three in the morning, uh, family guy nights where we had to throw away something and then we'd rewrite it the, the whole thing before the table and then after the table we have to change stuff because korea needs to have this by a certain date so you will work long hours but if you're on a show that's that's live action your hours tend to be longer but your season is shorter because after the last thing that gets shot you're done whereas as an animation writer it takes you know a lot of these shows take a year to make so you might write the script i might write a script right now that won't air until, you know, October of 2021 Jeez, or something. Crazy. So, so there are a lot of, you know, there are a lot of times to catch, like if it, it's always impressive if right. you can write a joke in your outline that makes it to TV, because there's so many times along the way that things get changed and moved. Right. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, do you, out of the three shows, the three Seth McFarlane shows, do you have a favorite episode or does something come to mind that you love uh, a scene or something? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I honestly don't have that. I'm not as well versed obviously in American dad cause I wasn't in that room. And, uh, you know, I, it's funny that I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to give you a bad answer in this, but I like, I don't have that specific scene that I love. I almost remember the stuff that we didn't get in more than the stuff that gets in. Mm -hmm. Um, having said that, like, uh, my, my, the moment that meant the most to me, I think was, I was in the first year, and again, you're in constant fear. The other thing about comedy that's terrible is your great sets you forget about, but your bad sets you keep forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so so it just, it's that kind of thing where, like, every time you pitch a joke and it gets a laugh, you, like, you feel strong enough that your job is safe for, I would say, two minutes. Right. So you feel like, all right, I'm not going to get fired for two minutes because I just got a laugh and they put it in the script, so now I can leave the room and give myself a Coca-Cola. Right. <laughs> uh, but in that first year, you know, we were all sitting around and, and everybody was firing on all cylinders and I'm trying to fit in and desperate to keep the job. And also I love right. it there. And I, I like, like I felt very at home, like this is something I want to do. 
Um, but you know, afraid every day, you know, cause people got fired and I was like, I, I, I thought that guy was fine. Why that, you know? Yeah, so exactly. I was getting nervous. Uh, but there was one day where, you know, early on in 04, if I pitched, uh, an area for a joke, which was in an episode where uh, all the family members or all the male family members and are taking Epicac to see who, who can last the longest without throwing up. <laughs> and, and that in the room sort of caught fire and, and Seth started pitching on it and it wound up becoming just this giant barf scene, uh, that got written. And, uh, you know, I just, I don't know. I just, it was one of those moments where you're like, Oh, thank, thank God. I came up with something that everybody liked, you know, right, right. And people weren't sure about me. And then it's like, Hey, he's the vomit guy. But I, <laughs> I mean, I, you're constantly, I mean, that's the thing about all these shows is you're only as good as your last joke. And, and some people have the, the uh, emotional and mental fortitude to deal with it. Uh, but you know, year after year, you, you just go, okay, is that the last funny joke I can ever come up with? Like, right. if you have a bad day at work, it sticks with you for weeks because then you go home and you, you write out entire premises just in case that happens again, you don't get caught out and that, you know, that you'll have something in the bag. Yeah. I mean, it's universal. I've, I've talked to actors, effects people, 3d people. I'm a video editor mostly. And every day they want you to come up with something amazing. And after a while, it's it's hard to come up with something amazing every day that blows everybody away. And, and you get burnt out and you need to take a walk or take a day off and go to the beach or something. Because just to crank, 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 you know, every single day is, yeah, is it's, hard. It's, oh, it's, it's next to impossible. And I, I actually... I mean, fortunately, they let me come back to Family Guy after I left to do other things. But I came back part time. And to me, that made all the difference because I was able to go do have life experiences. And then you can come back and, and you, don't, you don't even have to write the stuff because, you know, back in the days when you could walk down the street. But, you know, I, I would love when I would be in L.A. and I could take two weeks off, I'd go to New York and you just get on a subway and you see 100 stories happen in front of you. And you just sort of write down what you think might be a funny reason that that happened. I remember right. I, I remember walking by this mother and her maybe five-year-old child uh, just on the street. And, and I just, you know, because I was walking the opposite direction and all I heard was the, the, the child turned to the mom as they passed and say, uh, should we have helped that man? And I was like, that's such a wonderful, crazy moment story-wise because I don't know what she saw. I also know that you're putting the the innocence of a five-year-old into not understanding that sometimes you have to turn, for your own safety, you have to turn away from someone possibly, or maybe some the mother's too jaded to, you know what I'm saying? It was yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. stuff like that just opened up in me immediately, like, oh, I wanna know what that story is. Um, but right. when, you're, when you're in your car driving to work every day and you do it for months and months on end, you run out of human stuff. You just, you basically just have Howard Stern or whatever you're listening to yeah, in your car exactly. or, or it's just your anger at the UPS truck. That's you know, double parked. Exactly. I just think that, you know, whatever you call us creatives or whatever, um, we're, we're extremely sensitive, but we're also incredibly brave, which is like this weird dichotomy of a personality where you have to, I mean, do you have to be nuts to do stand up, and you have to be crazy to go into a family guy meeting with 20 people and pitch your stuff like, but you just, do it. But at the same time, like you said, the bad things or, or the bombs affect you. Um, and oh, that's yeah. just the way we are. That's the way creatives are. But, but I also like, <clears throat> I mean, the thing I gravitate towards is finding the, the weird, awkward humanity. You know, I mean, one of the things that that's great about uh, family guy is that you can write the most human scene, but make it between two two rats, you know, in a in a cellar. Yeah, <laughs> having a conversation. I mean, you but can they, do anything because it's animation. Yeah. yeah, whatever your imagination goes. Yeah, it can be crazy, but I'm saying I I actually think the grounded stuff in a ridiculous setting sometimes is great. I mean, one one of my favorite lines that I I don't think I had, to, had anything to do with, but. Uh, there was you know an early on episode from when I was there where you know Peter is in a coma. It was coma guy, I guess, uh, but. I, th I think it's the episode, but uh, basically he comes out of it and Lois is, you know, is, is like, thank God, because I, if you were a vegetable, I, I don't think, I don't think I'd stay. I mean, it was just, <laughs> it, it was like the most 
real thing any character on the show had ever said is that like I I got to be honest like if this goes south I'm out yeah, I'm out <laughs> that's hilarious uh, but I'm saying that like you it's very difficult you know to buy that back from a, a human character and still want to watch the show right but in a show like ours it's almost endearing because you're like yeah that's no one would ever say that no one would ever say that. okay so this has been so awesome man but we have a couple more things if you have time uh sure. Do you want to talk about Amy Poehler's new show that you worked on or? Sure. Uh, and then we'll just go to advice for people who want to be writers in Hollywood and all that. We'll just wrap it up. Sure. So go ahead. Uh, so yes, the show is called Duncanville. It's on Fox. It's airing for the next, uh, well, I mean, I don't know when this is going to go on, but it's on Hulu. Uh, but it, yeah, it's on Fox at 830 on Sunday nights between the Simpsons and uh, Family Guy, or actually Bob's Burgers, I think, and, and Simpsons. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a basically again sort of like in in a like how Springfield Springfield is not any in any state. This is a similar sort of rural town. Uh, it's called Duncanville after the the center character, who's a fifteen year old sort of uh, lazy but hopeful kid uh, who has you know just I think he sort of represents the part of us all that has big dreams but doesn't have the energy to to, to chase them but right. he's in love he's in love with the local girl uh the show is not I mean it's more the Simpsons than it is about this this character Duncan I mean there's a there's a 12 year old sister uh you know who's very media savvy there's a, an adopted five-year-old uh, Asian girl who's very funny and precocious and then the mother is the mother and the son are played by Amy Poehler and the mother is, you know, a very, uh, a, a very, I wouldn't say aggressive, but she's, she's a meter maid who, who is, who is trying to, to climb the corporate ladder or the, the government ladder to become a detective. Okay. And then the father's, the father's a plumber with a ponytail who always wanted, you know, who's like a, a giant seventies rock fan, uh, <laughs> who's sort of, he's, he's, he's a little bit of the the beta dad like he's the one that's crying constantly when the kids are growing up and he's always fo posting on facebook right um so it's i mean it's a it's a fun role reversal i mean amy poehler does a great job with with her voices and ty burrell is the dad he's hysterical and we just did we did an episode uh, that just aired this week where uh you know he's he's sort of lost his good looks and a better looking plumber has come to town to take his job so then the wife you know it, insists that he should try to get an you know he should just chase a new passion in work and of course she suggests he could be an accountant a certified certified public accountant mm -hmm. so she wants him to get like a real job right and then his, and his pitch is that he wants to put on a rock opera <laughs> so so we had a very i mean and uh mike scully and julie scully they wrote a, a lot of the or almost all of the songs with this composer bill for and it was it, it came out i thought it came out great but it was just sort of like a a tommy ripoff right um and, and there was just a lot of wacky stuff where you know there's some talking animals in the episode there's just there's there's some bending of reality which i like i mean one of the things i always gravitate towards and it seems obvious and but it's like the one-on-one -on -one of doing an animated show is why does this show have to be animated right so when you're in the pitch you know if you say it's family guy it's like well we have a talking baby and a talking dog and we do lots of cutaways to crazy places like okay that has to be animated but then if you have a show like king of the hill you you could have done that with only actors not to yes. say that that's bad or good i'm just i just think if you have and an, if you have an animated show, you should try to figure out some way to do it. And for us on this show, it tends to be fantasy sequences of the 15 year old boy. Okay. Mostly, mostly around uh, his love interest. Cool. It sounds really fun, man. I'll have to check it, it out. Yeah. It's, it's really, it's, it's been, it's been a good change, but it's like in the same, you know, the Venn diagram of all these shows, there's a, there's a large uh, area that's, that crosses over, but it's nice to try out new spaces. And also, when you haven't done 300 episodes, every episode you do, you discover something about the characters. Right. You know, and then you hopefully build on it later. Cool, man. Very cool. And let's just wrap it up with uh, advice you have for young comedians who write, who maybe want to work on animated shows or Saturday Night Live or do the kind of stuff that you did with sketch groups. Yeah, I, I, I'm. It's, it's always a tough question to get because as I said like I got to meet Seth and I was friends with Alec and Wellesley and they were going to be on Family Guy so that was definitely the the leg up I got in that direction but it's it's really a combination of I don't know how to describe I would say just like throwing yourself at everything and not not 
allowing the frustration to enter the work. And it's very tough. It's very tough. I mean, it's still tough to get there because every time I pitch a show and they say they don't want it. And then two years later, I see the exact show I pitched being brought by somebody else that they exactly, want to be in business yeah. with. You, you can't, you know, I mean, I, I had a show uh, that I, I thought was letter perfect um, for, you know, it was an animated show. We did a table read. I had like all a list people at it. And, and the, the, I wrote it with another, this guy, Dan Dratch, uh, and, and it came out great. It was about a medieval, it was about a medieval knight kind of working for a stupid King. Okay. Uh, and, and it, I just thought it, it clicked all the boxes that they needed, strong female characters, points of view, uh, good animation, talking dragons. I mean, it had all the stuff and it wasn't in any way similar to, to disenchantment. It was sort of a, a rough and ready kind of Flintstones versus a, a fairies and whatever uh, kind of thing. Right. And made, but anyway, we, we walked out of there. The, uh, I, people couldn't have said it was better. Everyone said, tell us when we start recording, we love it. And they passed on it on the way out the door. This was like three years ago. Right. And they, I was like, how can they pass on this? Like, Oh, it's just not what we want. This is not what we're looking for right now. And I, you know, I got on my computer and immediately uh, started looking at apartments in New York. And huh. I was like, I was like, this was my experience in LA. I did what you asked me to do. <laughs> you couldn't find anything wrong with it. And you just decided, you know what? We can't find anything wrong with it, but we're still going to say no. Right. So and at that point you go, oh, I can't win. Um, yeah. But, but you've done, you've done a lot of incredible things and worked at places where people would dream about working. And I think what I've seen from you and tell me if you're wrong, like, I've heard this before from other people is like, don't just send out your resume and sit back, do stuff, do stand up comedy, send, write spec scripts, et cetera. Like get out there, join a sketch group, take some classes, like be working towards something rather than just sitting around and waiting. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. I also think it's not a question, you know, I, I think it's also how you frame that it's, you know, I, I have a, I have a lot of friends. Again, it comes down to pride a lot of the time, mm -hmm. uh, and pride is really the, the, your biggest enemy in this business. Um, and and it's whether you know, like for example, I I had a commercial campaign that was running uh, from oh four to oh six uh, for Florida orange juice. Okay, and there was always a part of me that was like, I'm better than being. You know, I'm not flow from progressive. I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be a ma major motion picture actor. I'm right. Gonna, you know, but so I think. Some of that had to trickle into that. I, you know, I was like, I'm young. I'm going to be a big success. And that job went away and I wish I still had it. Uh, and I think it would have continued to open doors if it had, if I'd done it for more, but I just, you know, I had a pride issue and right. I think the pride is, is, you know, I have a lot of friends who've done acting and they go, uh, you know, I was like, like if you go to Tish or something and you come out of an acting program and you, you don't, you get a little work after college, but then you don't work. Someone will say to you in, like when you're 26, you know, there's a really good acting class and your first reaction is like, I don't need acting class. I am a professional. Right. But the truth is that's the same as saying, I don't need to go to the gym. I went to the gym when I was 20. I'm in good shape. And yes. instead you have to, you have to keep, because, because the, the, your success in this business is not going to come from you most of the time. It's going to come from someone else. So if, you know, I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've helped people or people have helped me because I was in an acting class with you 10 years ago and I realized that you did this character. And now that I'm at Family Guy, I can call you and say, right. oh, can you come do this voice? Because I assume you can still do that. And yep. and you're yeah. And you discover other stuff about yourself. So I, I think, yeah, you're everybody says the same thing. It's just hard day after day to to, to reinvent and and be your own taskmaster. But it does it does pay off. You just you just can't. You can't do repetitive actions that will drive you insane, uh, but you just have to keep, you know, just like like with an instrument, you just have to keep practicing the stuff you're good at and adding other stuff to it. Awesome, John. Thank you so much, man. This has been uh, really, really cool to talk to you about this stuff. Uh, I spent about three years of my life because my kids were like 13 and 15 uh, watching those three shows, Family Guy, Cleveland, and American Dad. <laughs> I also did, a, did you ever watch Phineas and Ferb with your kids? Yeah, I did, watched I, Phineas I, and Ferb. I, I did uh, the voice of Norm the Robot. Oh, really? You cool. Know, Dr. Doofenshmirtz is like, yeah, so that that was like, that, that was something that came out of one of the animators who was working at Family Guy had been working on this project forever, left and went over there and said, hey, John, I worked with you at Family Guy. 
would you be interested in doing the voice on this show? Nice. So, so cool. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's I, all connected, it, man. Everything's connected yeah. and it's all word of mouth and what you've done before. So thank you so much, man. This has been great. And we'll talk again soon, man. Thanks. I appreciate it so much. All right, sure. All right, take care. All right, take care. Thanks for listening to the Lights Camera Pro Podcast, where entertainment pros talk about how they made their dream into a career. Thanks for listening and subscribe to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram pages. Thanks to Bob Jurgens for the rock and VO and Joseph McDade for the music. Next time, we have a comedian, actor, and teacher. Lace Larrabee is here. She also has a podcast with Catherine Blanford called Cheaties. So check that out. See you next time.